Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's Becoming session. My name is Sidi Mashabesha, and welcome to another session of our Becoming series, where we come together to learn about careers in the energy efficiency sector. We're very grateful to have two sponsors who make the series possible. Those sponsors are Natural Resources Canada and Electricity Human Resources Canada. Both sponsors are key in growing the Canadian energy efficient force, and we couldn't do this without them. The Becoming series is where we meet leaders in the sector and hear their story about how they started, what skills are important for the role that they work in, and advice they have for people who'd like to follow in their footsteps. I also want to start this event before we start formally with a line acknowledgement. I live and work in Montreal, Quebec. Montreal is located on the unceded Indigenous lands of the Gane Kaha Nation, who are recognized as the custodians of the lands and waters of Jage, otherwise known as Montreal. If you haven't heard about it, after the event, you can join us on our new Discovery Hub. It's an online platform full of courses, events, and networking opportunities to make it easy to thrive in an energy efficiency career. You can join a specific role to be part of the community, and then you'll also find training courses, job postings, and hear from people who already work in the role. Today we'll be hearing from Luke Dolan. Hi, Luke. So just to let you know, we have Chloe Baptiste. Chloe works with at Efficiency Canada and will soon be leading the coming. Today we're from Luke Dolan about his career path as the owner of Capital Home Energy, Inc. Luke spent most of his career in the construction business. After years of seeing accumulated waste on construction sites and inefficiencies in the way businesses were operating, Luke wanted to make a change. So he decided to shift his career and his attention towards sustainable buildings. He started his new path as energy advisor for a consulting firm out in Vancouver. A year later, he started his own energy design firm called Capital Home Energy. Now Capital Home Energy works primarily on residential housing, conducting energy evaluations and advising on building code compliance to help builders and homeowners alike build and live in more energy efficient homes. Luke's determination to advance energy efficiency into the broader conversation also led him to start the Canadian Association of Consulting Energy Advisors, otherwise pronounced as CESA, or how do you pronounce it? Casey. Casey, thank you. Also teaches a building science course for the Canadian Home Builders Association. So Luke, with that being said, can we please ask you a little bit about what your career journey has been like up until this point? How did you start and how did you get here in your own words? Okay, great. Thanks for the introduction there, CD. I really appreciate it. Okay, so career journey, how did it start? How did I get here? So maybe I'll just start a little bit brief history on me. Currently, so for your audience out there, we're a energy design firm located in British Columbia. My office is in Vancouver, beautiful Vancouver. I'm actually, right now I'm on Vancouver Island. I grew up originally in Kitchener, Waterloo. So I'm an Ontario guy. So I grew up in Kitchener. And I went to University McMaster in Hamilton and a big sports background. So I played football, big high school football guy, and then played varsity football at McMaster. Also, we grew up ski racing as well, too. My parents, my dad's from Timmins, Ontario, which is North Ontario. He made a call to us, said, you, as kids, you either want to play hockey or do you want to ski? And we said, oh, ski. So we ended up becoming skiers. I grew up in a big hockey town. Of course, Kitchener is a big hockey town close to Toronto. Grew up skiing. Sports were a big part of our lives. I eventually migrated out west in my early 20s and lived in Whistler for quite a long time. So I'm sure everybody's heard of Whistler. Of course, they had the Olympics there in 2010 that kind of put Whistler on the map, but probably one of the best places to ski in North America. So I spent a long time there, probably about 25 years in Whistler in construction and construction and being a ski bum. It was a great lifestyle. We would work from April to December. And then a lot of us, well, some of us would go and teach skiing. I taught skiing and part-time professional ski racer. Traveled around a little bit for some ski events, actually tried out for the Olympics in 2010. My discipline was ski cross. So I was a ski cross guy. And uh, that was the Olympics in 2010 was the first time for ski cross in the world. And of course I didn't make the team. I was close, but they only, I think they only took four people. I was like number nine on the list, but anyways, living in Whistler in the construction industry, even when I'm growing up in high school, like I definitely had worked construction as summer jobs. I've been in construction practically all my life. And there was a brief moment in time where I did move back to Ontario and I started up a small little construction company with my brothers and then moved back out West again. And I was managing a painting company in Whistler and CD said in the intro, the thing that led me into the sustainability field was I was really sick and tired of the waste in the industry, like the actual physical waste, like seeing all the garbage on job sites and the crap and the amount of waste that we produced when we were either building a house or even we were painting big hotels in Whistler, we would create all this waste. And so I did a career shift and I wasn't really sure what to do. It's scary when you do a career shift. It took about eight months off and just fell into this energy advisor role. Got hired by a consulting firm in Vancouver 
and they trained me. I got certified with Natural Resources Canada and went and started working for them and loved it. And within a year, I'd started up my own company just by myself, just started my own company. I had some previous experience running a business before a little bit. So I knew that world a little bit, but you figure it out as you go. So I started my own company and then started doing energy evaluations on houses. It was primarily back then, this would have been in 2008, 2009, 2010, around that zone. We was primarily existing homes. So doing a lot of energy evaluations or energy audits on homes. The industry was primarily fueled by rebates. So government rebates for making your house more energy efficient. And that was fueling the market. And that's where I was getting most of my work for homeowners that were looking to make their houses more energy efficient and hopefully get some rebates back at the same time. So that's what kind of got me into the industry. And it's been a bit of a roller coaster ride industry ever since, but I've managed to stick it out. And now in BC, we're lucky because BC, I would say, is got the strictest building code across the country when it comes to energy efficiency. Even though we have some of the warmest climate zones in the country too, like where I live, even in Vancouver is the warmest climate zone in Canada per se. Our winters are definitely different than your winters. We do get snow, but it's not, doesn't stick around for very long. And when we do get snow, the entire city shuts down because they don't have snow removal like they do back East and no one puts snow tires on and you don't want to be driving around Vancouver when it's snowing, unless you know how to drive all of us. Ontario or Eastern folks always make fun of the Vancouver drivers because they can't drive in snow because a lot of them don't have snow tires. But anyways, that's one great thing about BC. It's definitely leading, it's cutting edge as far as energy efficiency in housing across the country. So it's really cool to be a part of that right now. From a job perspective and from a business perspective, that has led businesses like myself, we're able to grow our businesses because we've become code we're codified. You have to hire a company like us if you're going in for a building permit. When I first got into the business, like I said earlier, it was very related on rebate programs. So it was challenging. Rebate programs come and go, and it's really tough to run your business centered around government or utility rebate programs because they just, they just come and go. And it's hard to build your business. Now that energy efficiency is in the building code, it's been a good chance for me to actually grow and build the business. So now I've got a team around me. It's great. We're fluctuating between 12 to 15 people in the company and we're doing energy evaluations for new and existing homes all over BC. That is very cool. That's quite the journey. Like, first of all, physical journey of moving from out east, out west, but also your path of starting businesses previously and getting to where you are now. It's a very interesting path indeed. And so with what you're doing now, with the government support that is out there with codification, everything. What would you say is your favorite part about your job? Yeah, favorite part about my job, a couple things. The team I work with, my staff is phenomenal. And I'm working with, for the most part, I'm the old, I'd say, no, there's one other, I've got another uh, gentleman who's older than me, but for the most part, younger than me. Amazing people that I work with. I've been lucky to bring together this team of professionals. And that's one of the things I really enjoy about the job. Also the clients, the builders that we work with, the architects, like we're just little consultants, the builders I have the utmost respect for because they're the ones who are boots on the ground dealing with a lot of things in the industry right now, especially code changes that are happening so fast and there's a lot of changes going on. So it's great to work with those professionals. It is really rewarding, very rewarding. So that working with professionals, my team is also fun to work with too. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. And then. You've highlighted what the fun side of everything is with the great people you work with. What do you think are some of the challenges of the work that you do? And that's another good question too. The challenges, I think like from, a, I'll talk from two sides of it maybe, but from a staff side of it, like when, so when we're hiring new recruits, we joke or we kid ourselves, like we say, oh, we're saving the planet one house at a time. Mm -hmm. we're joking around. And I think a lot of people sometimes get into the business and they really are super keen on sustainability and, and improving the environment that we live in, etc. And then they realize well, it's not all as glamorous as it's cracked up to be sometimes. Like there is a day in day out slog sometimes and you're make, but you are making small wins, which is great. So yeah. So I would say sometimes people come in with maybe unrealistic expectations, thinking that you're going to see these like massive changes and that doesn't happen. That's not real small changes, which is really good to see. And that's rewarding in itself. I don't know. Does that make sense? It does make sense. You're working with slow, progressive change. And so obviously it's definitely hard to see things day to day, but I think with time you get to see the results of your work. Yeah, exactly. So big picture, you do see stuff going on, but there is 
there's the day-to-day -day grind, like other jobs, right? Yeah. Of course. And so I'm sure people are curious, what is your typical day-to-day -day, or do you like, do you even have a typical day-to-day? -day? Yes. A very typical day-to-day. -day. I'm a father. So I've got two young kids. We have a, I've got a four-year-old and a five-month-old. So it's dealing with the kids in the morning, getting one of them off to daycare and then it's, yeah, it's, it's to work. So a day in the life of an energy advisor. So energy advisors, we primarily work on residential homes. So it's residential construction for existing home and new construction. And we're part-time out in the field. We're out in the field. We're on job sites, like new construction job sites. We're in people's houses, doing assessments, talking to people, making their houses, trying to make their houses more energy efficient, helping them reduce their utility costs, making them more comfortable, that sort of stuff. So we're spending a lot of time on site, on job sites, we were also in front of the computer a lot too. So that could kind of segue into what is the skill set of an energy advisor. It, it very well-rounded technology is huge. We're very up on technology. You need to know computers inside and out because we spend a lot of time on our computers and, but we're also in the field. So you have to know construction, you have to know houses. You really have to know your stuff. There's a lot to learn. There's a lot to know. You got to know build, building science. There's so much going on, really cool things in the business right now or in the industry. We're in the wild west. We like to joke around. We say the wild west of building right now. So there's all sorts of different techniques, wall assemblies, air barrier systems, and all sorts of things that we're doing nowadays, but you really have to understand how these systems work. We're, we're really cognizant of avoiding unintended consequences. When we're giving recommendations to people, we are trying to also make sure that they're not going to make a mistake while they're doing it. I'll give you an example. A lot of what we do is whether it's a new construction house or an older house, we're telling people to make their houses more airtight. So we're going into houses and saying, okay, you want to reduce your need for energy, keep the heat in and keep the heat out in the summer. One of the ways you do that is you make your house more airtight. So airtight construction. So that's, it's all good. But if you're not ventilating properly, you're going to have problems. So that's a major thing. So it's one thing for us to come into a house and say, okay, you need to make this house more airtight. But you could make an older existing home too airtight. So you have to make sure that if you're going to take that house and make it very airtight, that you're also looking at your ventilation system so that you're now going to be bringing in some fresh air to that home. So you really have to be careful sometimes of the upgrades that you're giving to homeowners. So day in the life of part-time in the field and part-time in front of a computer. Perfect. And I, we have a follow-up question from an audience member. Lucas Porter asks, to follow up on your earlier answer, what is the split of office-based versus on-site based work? Good question, Lucas. I would say it's almost 50-50. I didn't mention, but yeah, we're modeling. We're energy modelers too. So we're spending a lot of time in front of the computer doing energy modeling. A well-rounded energy advisor is probably 50 to 60% in the field. And then the rest, 40%, 50%. In front of a computer now i do have some on staff that are 100 percent in front of a computer but when i first got started it was up until a few years i don't get on job sites very much anymore unfortunately i miss that part of it because when you're running a business you're spending more time in no, front of the computer it's a pretty even split so it's nice too that's one thing that draws a lot of people to the job because it keeps it interesting you're not just sitting in front of a computer all day long some people don't mind that some people do mind that so it's a nice job because it splits that up Okay, perfect. Thank you. And so another question we have from Leo Herbert is, do you have difficulty finding contractors who are trained and certified to do the work as prescribed? We don't actually do the work. If I'm interpreting this question correctly, we're not actually the ones going into the house and doing the work. We're only coming into the house and doing an assessment on the house, doing an evaluation. We're letting the homeowners know that, Hey, if you did this and this and this, you can save X amount of energy. Then it's up to them to go hire contractors to come in and do the work. We're considered third party neutral. We're giving like third party neutral advice. We're not affiliated. We don't take kickbacks from any companies. We're not allowed to as part of our certification through Natural Resource Canada. We're completely neutral. We don't pick sides. We help guide the homeowners. Another question we have from Tao Zhang is what kind of professional certifications are mandatory for an energy advisor and energy auditing companies? So it's all run through Natural Resources Canada. We used to call ourselves Certified Energy Advisor, but in 2016, the title Certified got dropped from our name and now we're called Registered Energy Advisors. So we hold our licensing through the federal government. So through Natural Resources Canada, we're a private company, but we hold our, 
are licensed through the federal government. So through Natural Resources Canada, there's a series of exams that you have to take and then a series of test files and training that you have to get in order to become an energy advisor. Okay, perfect. Alrighty. And then Leo Herbert also asks, is there a marketing strategy targeting Indigenous youth to get into this work? I believe so. I think the, I know the federal government is pretty heavy on that right now. I know that there was a lot of money that recently that got put toward Indigenous communities, especially as far as from a career standpoint, because there's not enough energy advisors. So that's the perception anyways. So the federal government has been giving out research, but also money towards certain organizations and groups. And I believe that the Indigenous folks, but it's not part of my expertise. I know that we actually work with local Indigenous groups doing assessments on houses throughout the lower mainland in British Columbia. Awesome. And actually piggybacking off that question about targeting different groups and different youth, what do you feel like it, it, to get into different careers on your end, who do you feel like really helped impact your career journey? Whether it was mentors, believers, or haters, if you have any, everyone does. Who do you feel like really impacted your journey along the way? Yeah, another good one. I would go back to my mom and dad and the way that I was brought up, I think. They were both entrepreneurs, hardworking. My dad left home when he was literally nine years old, came from a small town, rural town, very poor, and lived with one of his brothers and then eventually started up his own company. He had shoe stores across Southern Ontario. And I came from a family of five, four brothers and a sister. Hardworking parents, they would be my mentors, I'd say for sure. Like just hardworking, honest, dedicated people. I also think back to sports. I think back to some of my coaches, especially in high school. I played rugby, played football, very physical sports. It was interesting, the discipline that it taught you to work hard, the ethics, like the sports ethics, like we were taught, like hit the guy as hard as you can, but then help them up. And so that really always resonated with me. It was very hard, but at the same time, like it's one of those things when you're a kid, sometimes you're thinking, oh, your parents are too hard on you. Then when you grow up, you realize, okay, I'm glad they were because it taught me to be a hard worker and it ingrained some things into you that are the reason that you're successful later in life. I agree. Looking back, there's some things where I was like, should have been easier, but it makes life easier down the line. So it definitely resonates with me and I'm sure with a lot of other people. And so chatting about when you were younger, I know that you mentioned being involved in lots of sports and how you, at one point in your life, tried out for the Olympics, but I'm curious about when you were 10 years old, what did you want to do? Remember? And how is this similar or different? That's a really tough question. 10 years old. Just at some point in your like early developmental stages, do you remember what you want to do? Yeah. I want to play for the Denver Broncos. The last thing I ever thought was I'd be in this field. I think that this field didn't even exist probably back then. I probably didn't even really know what I wanted to do until I was in my thirties, to be honest with you. I guess everybody's path is different. Sometimes you, you spin your wheels, so to speak. I was really happy the way that, or lucky maybe that I wasn't searching for that huge career out of university. I went as far as I could from home as possible in the country. I got away from the parents. I was lucky I landed in Whistler and, and lived a really fun lifestyle. I met a lot of really cool people and that was great, but I didn't really have that focus until later. Then all of a sudden reality kind of hits you and then you're like, okay, I better get focused now. So yeah, I don't know. I was, yeah, I didn't really ever have that thing where I'm like, oh, I want to be this. It just never did. It never worked out that way for me. Okay, right, cool. That's fair because you had at the very, like at the most important thing is you have the discipline instilled in you. So once you figure it out able to go all guns blazing. And now that you're in this sustainability space, we do have a question from Claudia who says, what can you recommend for those professionals looking for a career in the energy efficiency and sustainability space? Any training or courses, volunteer opportunities, and what kind of companies can professionals look for in order to enter the sector? Yeah, this was a good one. I was looking forward to this kind of question because I see this a lot in the business. There's, well, there's so many opportunities. There's so much going on in energy efficiency and the sustainability sort of sector or world. There's education, like free education everywhere. There's webinars, companies do webinars. You can find things, join associations, builder associations, 
look on provincial websites, municipal websites, get on newsletters. Progressive cities like the city of Vancouver, they're always putting out all sorts of stuff in their newsletters. You can join our newsletter as well too. We're always putting out there like industry events. There's a lot of really good free education out there. <clears throat> and I'm sure it's like that in Ontario or all the way across the country as well. So provincially, locally looking for things. To get into the business is an interesting one. I find these days, especially when we're looking for people to hire, we get a lot of resumes. A lot of resumes come across my desk. A lot of people with a lot of education. I'm sure everybody's already always heard this, right? You got a lot of education, but you don't have any experience. It's the chicken before the egg thing. And I don't think that's ever going to change. That's not going to change unless you're like really specializing in some kind of field that whatever your educational background is requiring, like becoming a nurse or a doctor or something like that. But in our field, I would say, get your hands dirty, get out there, work for a construction company, pick up a skilled trade and learn and then you have a lot of respect for the people in the construction industry because, you know, the ones that are actually working, like using their hands, I have the utmost respect for anybody who's in construction. And then that kind of gives you some good options too. You learn what's going on because I find sometimes we get a lot of people with a lot of education, although they don't even have the experience, like they never walked on a job site before. They don't know what it's like to get on a construction site before. And that's a whole different ball game. How do you go? We're kind of like the new kids on the block when it comes to consultants. And you, you walk on a job site, a construction site, you know, it's very macho, right? You get on a construction job site, you have to know how to assert yourself. And that's a bit of an art to itself, being confident, but also knowing what's going on in a job site. Like we'll come in a job site sometimes and we have to do some air tightness testing. So we'll have to shut the site down or we have to tell everybody, okay, we're going to be doing this air tightness test. So you got to stop what you're doing or you have to either be locked in this house for a couple hours. And that's tough because you know, you're dealing with plumbers, electricians, and they're all running around trying to get their jobs done. And then all of a sudden we're these like guys coming in here with a hard hat and a safety vest on, and we're telling them that they got to shut things down. So you got to be able to do that in a respectful manner. So there's a lot of things to that whole world. So I would suggest anyone who's going to get involved specifically with energy advising, try and get some experience on job sites, work in a construction company, if you can. I find that there is a lot of consultants out there joking around. Do we really need any more consultants or who do we need? Definitely more skilled people, skilled trades for sure. And it's a great career. They make a good living for themselves. It's very rewarding. It's very satisfying, but it's hard on the body too. Like I work construction and it is hard on the body. And once you do physical labor, anything is easy after that. I'm going to actually follow a question from Anthony Braganza who says, how physically demanding or awkward can an energy audit be for an existing home, example, attics, crawl spaces for a 50 year old? Good question. Good question. Very good question. So I've got a gentleman who runs my Vancouver Island outfit or Vancouver Island division, and he's older than me and he's young fifties, 53, 54. It's funny how the two of us met, but anyways, he's a ex world cup rugby player. Oh, so wow. he played for Canada in the world cup. I think back in the nineties, he used to play professional rugby in France. And he's a big guy, like he's a 300 pounder. Yeah, he's a big, big, strong guy. And he has to go into attics and he's got to go into crawl spaces. And he's a big dude. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you got to be active for sure. Cause you are crawling around in crawl spaces that are like two feet in height. And then you're getting up into attic spaces. So you need to be physically fit for sure. Which is a good thing, right? So it keeps you nimble. You got to be able to climb into attics and climb around job sites and stuff too. Yeah. So sounds challenging for sure. <laughs> we have a question from Jason Chang who says, hi, Luke, I've read the CHBA builder's manual cover to cover and passed the foundational exam back in May. Been studying for the EA exam since and plan to write that within the next week or two. For my next steps, do you have any advice on what to look for in terms of SOs, like good and bad business practices? Basically, mm. what does a good service organization look like? That's a good question, Jason. So for those of you who don't know, there's companies called service organizations go between Natural Resources Canada and an energy advisor. As an energy advisor, you have to align yourself with service organization or multiple service organizations. We just call them SO short, so you can work with multiple SOs. For aligning yourself with reputable ones, that's a really good question. First of all, I would go to the association's website and look for service organizations that are also members of Casey. 
you should join Casey. So you can message uh, Cindy, our executive officer, and Cindy will look after you as far as getting you signed up, even if you're a EA in training. And then you want to do due diligence, look on their websites, look on Better Business Bureau, talk to people, try and get referrals about that company because there are good ones and maybe not so great ones out there. So you want to be lining yourself with obviously a reputable company for sure. The way that you find that is start with, uh, with Casey and look for ones. When we started this association, I actually started it myself personally. I started it back in 2014. And one of the reasons was because we wanted to raise the professionalism in our industry because we didn't really have a trade association. We are still pretty young as an association, but that was the thing. We definitely hold ourselves at a higher level than others in the industry. We're trying to get more members. We don't have everybody in the industry as a member yet. And there might be some members that are really good, some associations that are good that aren't members. But I would start with Casey and also just start doing your homework. Thank you very much. And then we have a question from David Katz who asks, how can we use this waste to make electricity? Good question, David. It's out of my realm of expertise. I come from the side of it of reducing waste on job sites to begin with. So using more responsible materials on job sites and creating less waste. I think there are technologies out there that you can convert waste into energy. That will be one of the nicest things. It might already exist. I don't know. We have a question from Anthony Braganza who asks, on average, how much could an EA make working a nine to five, five days a week? It depends on how much you're going to put into it. It's like a lot of other jobs, I guess. It's uh, how much you want to put into it. So if you're looking for a cruisy career where you punch in at nine o'clock and you punch out at 430, then you're going to, you're going to get what you put into it. One of my biggest advice to people out there, one of the things I find with, especially with younger people nowadays is who wants the big bucks right off the bat. And that's just not reality, right? You're not going to get the big bucks right off the bat. You got to put your time in and you got to hustle and you got to work hard. There is no fast track. I find people get bored after six months. You got to put your time in and work hard and put your head down. When I met my wife, I was working 14, 16 hour days. I was single guy. I was working my butt off. And then you can start making some decent money. I'm not going to throw any dollar values here, but it really depends on how much you want to put into it. But just to give you an idea, if you're willing to put some time into it, then you'll be rewarded. You can make a decent living for yourself for sure. It's very fulfilling, not just in it for the money, but of course you, know, you got to pay the bills and you want to have a decent life. But if, if you work, you essentially got to work your butt off. Work hard, you're going to be rewarded for it, regardless of what you do. That's very true. Thank you, Luke. Okay. So then one of our final questions is how do you see yourself evolving within your industry? It's keeping up with technologies. So technologies in our industry, new types of insulation, different building techniques. So keeping up to date with what's coming, keeping up to date with building code changes is huge. Everything is moving so fast right now. The building industry construction itself hasn't really changed much for 40 years. Then all of a sudden, about five years ago, like if you're looking at a curve, the curve went like this and now all of a sudden it went like this and now it's going like this, you know, in the building world, we're heading towards 2030 net zero targets. They say all new homes in BC by 2030 will be net zero ready. Net zero house is a house that produces as much on-site renewable energy as it consumes. And we're almost there already. It's keeping training up. Like I, myself, I'm constantly doing webinars. Of course, I also teach as well too, but I'm also just constantly learning from other professionals, engineers, architects. You really got to stay up on top of all the things that are happening right now in the business. Awesome. Thank you. And I think that's great advice for everyone to just wherever you are at in your journey. I guess the final question we have for you is where can people find and learn from you? What social media, do you have any upcoming projects or what kind of things you'd like to share with the audience? Sure. We've got an Instagram account. So you can find us Capital Home Energy. We're always posting some cool stuff on there, like projects that we're working on. We, we like to highlight the builders projects that we're working on. That's probably their biggest thing. Instagram, LinkedIn, a little bit of Facebook. I'm signed up for our newsletter. Go to our website. It's Capital Home Energy. Dot com and you should be able to go to our blog and you should be able to sign up for our newsletter. Check it out. So Luke, just want to say again, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today and to share your experiences and everyone else in the audience. Thank you for participating and attending today. I hope it was very fruitful. I love the conversation with you, Luke. And do you have any additional questions or final words for us? I want to say thanks for giving me the opportunity to come on. I'm very passionate about everybody the younger generation. And I love the passion that they bring to the table. It's really easy to get caught up in all the doom and gloom. The stories don't get told enough, but there's so many positive things going on right now. It's not as doom and gloomy 
is what they say. So stay positive out there. There's lots of issues, but you find your little thing and you make that part of the world better. And then that'll ripple outwards. So stay positive folks. Thank you. That's amazing advice. And I'm not sure how to follow that. So with that, thank you everyone. Thank you, Luke. Thank you, Chloe. Have a good one. Bye. Thank you.